Dr. Brad Stanfield is a medical doctor trained and practicing in New Zealand. He has created a popular YouTube channel where he shares the latest research around why we age and if we are any closer to finding ways that extend health span. And with that, let me start the interview. So, hello, Dr. Stanfield. So, welcome to Modern Health Span. It's great to have you on our channel today. Thank you very much. Thank Glad you. to be here. Dr. Stanfield, can you tell us, so what got you interested in aging? I mean, originally, and, and was this kind of before you took up medicine or like after? Yeah, so I've always been interested in healthcare. So I used to compete in various different sports as I was growing up, and I always wanted to find a performance edge. So that kind of got me into the supplement world initially. And then I went to medical school. Uh, and that's when I started to notice little, you know, wrinkles appearing in my face. And that got me wondering, is there anything that we can do to actually prevent aging from happening in the first place? Um, and that got me onto, you know, looking at things like metformin, um, looking at ways to lower IGF-1 levels. Um, and it kind of snowballed from there. And then I came across people like um, uh, Dr. David Sinclair's podcast uh, well, when he was being interviewed by Joe Rogan. Um, and so I, I was encouraged to see that there was so much preclinical work that was happening and I wanted to create a resource that people could actually go to that focus, not necessarily on the preclinical work, but actually on the human data, because what I was noticing is that a lot of people were getting very excited and to be honest, carried away with some of the data that was coming out from the preclinical world in terms of, you know, cell and mice data, um, and I wanted to create a resource that actually focused on the human clinical research to actually give people actionable ways to prevent disease from happening in the first place. Interesting. So, and is that why you started the YouTube channel? Yeah, that's right. So I wanted to, yeah, I, again, I wanted to create a resource that people could, mm. you know, see the data for themselves and make their own, make mm. their own health choices. Uh, Cause I think it, it's very easy to, you know, for people to present theories about, you know, how to improve health. But I think if you actually boil it down, it doesn't really matter what a person's opinion is. What actually matters is what the clinical research actually shows. So a lot on my channel, I talk about the so-called evidence pyramid um, and how you judge clinical data using that framework. So I try and encourage that framework um, and present the data to my listeners uh, on the YouTube channel. So when so human data does not show extended health well health span generally because we live too long right you can see that in mice but you can't so when you're looking at papers that ref, i guess clinical trials so what are you looking for in terms of data that will be actionable so most of the human data that we've got so so let's take metformin for example hmm. we've got fantastic data in metformin showing that for diabetic patients uh, so type two diabetics, that is, if you prescribe them metformin alongside a great diet and regular exercise, that there are lifespan benefits compared to placebo. So that to us says, you know, in certain diseased populations, if you treat them with the correct medications and, you know, lifestyle things, you can improve their lifespan and health span. So a lot of it depends on how you're actually designing the clinical trials. Because you're absolutely right, you know, humans have got a really long lifespan. And if you're trying to figure out would a particular intervention extend lifespan, you're going to be waiting decades for that data to come through. So that's not really feasible. So it's really important to design a clinical trial where you can actually get actionable data from it. So typically what, the, you know, good population, uh, good clinical trials do is again, choose a diseased population and see whether a particular intervention will actually improve the health of that diseased population population and then depending on the data that you get from that you might be able to start using that in otherwise healthy people that leap still needs a lot of work um, but again it's it's around the clinical trial design yeah so, so one last kind of question in this area so has have your thoughts changed on like aging since you've been kind of diving into it for the last was it two years or so yeah that's right so when i first started my channel, I thought we were on the verge of massive breakthroughs in terms of how to slow, if not reverse aging. And I'm less convinced that that's the case, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, if reading through all of the hype, um, there's very little, if any, human data showing that we can actually reverse 
aging. So I, I want to caveat that there's many things that people can do now to improve their health span. So, you know, we know that diet and exercise, for example, play a massive role in our health. And I think that the overall goal for my channel is kind of change to find ways for people to actually extend their health span. So what I mean by that is making sure that they've still got the strength to actually do the activities that they want to do. Because I'm dealing with patients in the clinic who unfortunately they're at rest homes, they're at private hospitals, and they've lost their muscle mass, they've lost their strength. So they need carers a lot of their time for just you know showering and their and their cooking. So I want to find ways to actually extend a person's uh, health span where they can retain that strength so that they can do the things that they want to do. Right, which is a good segue. So let, let's talk about like how we would actually do that, how you would actually extend health span. So we, we talked about, so like exercise, sleep, meditation, diet. Well, I guess re relaxation and diet. Would, would those be the, the four big ones? Yeah, so a lot of my channel, I talk about supplements and mm. research behind supplements, but really the, the, the meat of it, if you like, for someone's health is the things that you've mentioned. So diet, sleep, exercise, meditation, a good social network, mm. um, a purpose in life. Those are the things that really matter. And we can see that through the data and there's very good data on that. You know, a, a diet that's high in sugar, for example, or, or too many calories in the diet will shorten your lifespan. Um, it's the same thing with, with exercise, not enough exercise, the muscles start to become weaker. And again, you, you unfortunately, you start to land up in rest homes and private hospitals. So there's many things that we can do um, now to improve our health span. When it comes to supplements, there are certain supplements that are promising, but at this stage, we don't have robust human data yet saying that for already healthy people, you should be taking these supplements. So exercise, uh, do, you, do you have, what do you think is like the best form of exercise? Although maybe best is, is, is difficult to define. Um, the, the most effective for extending health span. Yeah, going online, you'll read different opinions about this. And mm. there's many different opinions because there's many conflicting research points or research papers about the, the best form of exercise. But, but for me, I, I think the research boils down to, you do want the mixture between cardio, as in you know going for runs or going onto an exercise cycle bike and weight training. You do want to have both and you want to have a mixture of both. There does seem to be some data coming through about how important high intensity interval training is. So personally for me, that's what I do for my cardiovascular fitness is about two or three times a week, I am doing high intensity interval trainings. Um, and th there are different ways you can actually try and maximize your, your time or, or your benefit from the high intensity interval trainings. But that's what I do for cardio. And then for about three or four days in the week, um, I'm doing weight training. So I want to have a mixture of both. And sometimes I'll be, I'll be doing the the hit trainings or high intensity interval training and the weight trainings on the same day but just divided so one in the morning and one at night okay so interesting so in the hit would you mind sharing what do you think is the best kind of ratio because there's again there's conflicting should you do like four minutes off four minutes on or, or like 10 seconds off and like tabata style it kind of depends on how much time you've got. So the, it, it seems like you can get a massive benefit quite quickly and then it kind of tapers off and you still get a benefit the longer that you train, but it's it's less acute, if you like. So the, there was actually some interesting research coming out around sprint training. So it looks like if you do exercise at 100% of your maximal heart rate and you do that for about 30 seconds and then have you know a four minute rest and do that again for 30 seconds and then a four minute rest that gives you significant cardiovascular benefits. So if for, for people who are constrained for time, such as myself in the morning, that's, that's what I do. I do a small hit workout that would only take about 10 minutes, but you're getting such a, a massive benefit in that small amount of time. Um, and then with the weight training, uh, that's usually in the afternoon that I do that. If I've got time towards the end of the day. So you said heart, maximum heart rate. So is this, do you judge that from the heart rate or do you just judge that from you're just doing a hundred percent effort? Yes. So you, I, I certainly don't think that you need to have a heart rate monitor. If you've got one that that's great, but I don't think it's needed for mm. me. Um, when I go onto it, so I've got an extra cycle at home and I, I picked it up secondhand. It cost me $70 and I think that's all you need. So I just plug my, um, 
I plug my music in and I warm up for about three or four minutes. And then I'm going as hard as I possibly can on that exercise for about, so, so it's in total about 45 seconds because I'm counting a little bit of time to actually get my heart rate all the way up. Um, and I, I go as hard as I possibly can. Um, so I'm, I'm knackered by this point. It's, it's difficult, right? To, to go at 100% of your maximum for 45 seconds. And then I take about, yeah, three or four minutes of, of gentle going on the exercise cycle, catching my breath again, and then hitting myself hard for another 45 seconds. And then once I finish that, then it's a sort of five or well, four minute warm down um, and then a little bit of stretching and continue with my day. So, you know, all up it's 10 or 12 minutes, but you're getting such an epic benefit just in that small workout. And yes, you if if you've got a long period of time, you can do other forms of, of HIT or high intensity interval training that will give you more benefit compared to that 10 minute window. But in terms of time efficiency, that's the workout that I personally like. Good thing. Yeah, no, that sounds good. Diet is, we kind of touched on that as like, you don't have lots of sugar, but, and, and diet is even more contentious than exercise, I would say. Um, so do you have any thoughts on how to maximize the diet? It's a really interesting and difficult question. Cause once again, there's so many different opinions online and there's so many different opinions because the data is mixed. A lot of where people are making these assumptions in terms of the so-called best diet is based on observational data. So that's where you're looking in the review mirror at what people have done with their, with their diets and just observed them. So it's not a randomized controlled trial where you're actually trying to make a change in someone's life. And because you're looking in the review mirror, the data that you glean from that is often skewed. There's a lot of different confounding factors. So it's difficult to then figure out what is the best diet. And I think there was a paper that Dr. Matt Cable and actually recently co-authored. Uh, I think it came out in November or December of last year. And he went through all of the mice data, all of the human data uh, around so-called anti-aging diets. And when you, uh, when you control for calories, there doesn't actually seem to be much of a, a clear winner, if you like, as to one particular diet. And one of the things that is interesting from that paper is that he wonders whether a lot of the benefits, if you like, from particular diets are, are around mTOR activation. So mTOR is an enzyme in the, in the body, in the cells, and that detects, you know, how much protein is, is in the, um, is available to actually build muscle. Um, and, and a lot of it controls many different things. So he's, yeah, one of the interesting things from that trial is, are all of these diets subtly influencing mTOR? And is that uh, is that the true target of what we're trying to do with diets? So to answer your question overall, we don't have one best diet yet. You know, if you talk to people who do the keto diet, they'll swear by the keto diet. If you talk to, to people who do vegan diet, they'll swear by vegan diets. We don't know is, is, the, is the answer at the moment. Um, it seems that you do want to have a low sugar diet. And you want to make sure that you're not having too many calories and you want to have a wide and varied diet. But aside from those fundamental basic things, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced there's one true best diet yet. Yeah, I, I saw that, yeah, that Dr. Cablin tweeted about like calorie restriction doesn't always lengthen life, which, is, which I was surprised at, I must admit. That, that. Yeah, that there are some genotypes where calorie restriction doesn't agree with them um, mm. but he was also making the point that calorie restriction is a so-called dirty intervention and, and what he means by that is calorie restriction will affect a lot of different pathways in the body so it can be quite difficult then to figure out which pathways you want to be influencing and which ones you don't um, whereas you know we've got with mTOR we can switch that off really effectively with medications and and it's a clean way of of influencing mTOR as well so yes with with particular diets you can influence M mTOR but you're also influencing a whole range of other things so would it be better just to focus on mTOR and and with a medication would, would that be a better option as opposed to trying to influence it with a diet which i think is an interesting concept as well those are the kind of the big ones like exercise diet sleep medication so there's other things that like Dr. Sinclair suggests, like cold showers, saunas. Do you think these make any significant difference? I mean, is it worth the pain of having a cold shower? 
it's tricky. There's very good mechanisms behind why things like cold showers would be useful or, or why saunas would be useful. There's actually a lot of data coming through from Finland around saunas. And again, it was observational data. So looking in the rearview mirror, but it seems that people who frequently used sauna baths, they had lower rates of heart disease, which is an interesting finding. But it, it's, it's tricky to design a, a randomized clinical trial around that um, to, to actually figure out, is there a true effect or not? So I think it's interesting and possibly you might see benefits with cold showers and saunas. Um, but but, but it, I think it's a possibility and that's the, key, that's the key thing to emphasize. It might work, but equally it might not. And we don't have enough data yet to, to say one way or the other. Interestingly though, the Interventions Testing Program, which is a program run in the United States, and what they do is trial a, a select group of molecules each year to figure out will they extend lifespan in mice. And what's different about this program is that they run the same experiment at the same time in three separate labs to work out whether these interventions will actually extend lifespan or not. And they use genetically heterogeneous mice. Essentially, all that means is that they're genetically diverse. And there was a particular molecule that they tested, um, which activates uh, so-called um, heat shock proteins. And with that molecule, there, there wasn't a lifespan extension benefit. So w whether, you know, w whether you can extrapolate that to say saunas won't have much benefit or not, don't know, don't have enough data, but I, I think that's just an interesting point to bring up.